So this is the second session in this series of uh, classes and discussions on the foundational text of Indian philosophy. So if you remember, in the last session, I mentioned a few things about the uh, gradation uh, of the philosophical and spiritual uh, canonical literature of Hinduism. I mean, the canonical literature, the entire Hindu uh, canon can be divided into three fundamental categories. One, the, uh, I mean, at the highest level, we have what is called Vedanta Upanishads, or in the more traditional circles, it's called Sruti. Uh, in fact, one definition of Sruti itself is um, Sruyeti Brahmadinam Paramatmanam Labhantaidi Veda. So, Rishankaracharya in his uh, Bhashya Sana Sujadi uh, Bhashya, he says, you know, a source of uh, spiritual uh, canonical literature from which we hear, we learn uh, about the fun fundamental spiritual principles of life and existence, which are common to all people, all times, all ages, irrespective of the change in terms of times, geography, culture, and so on. Some of the fundamental spiritual questions and subjects and topics are discussed. And finally, the conclusion is reached in the Advaita, the non-dualistic system of Vedanta, which teaches that there is one divine spark present in all of us, it's called Sarva Antaryami, the indweller, and it is all-pervading, it is omnipresent, it is Sarva Vyapi, and then it is transcendental, it is Sarva Atida. This is the highest conclusion of Indian philosophy. So the, I already mentioned this. Now, the second, at the second level, there is a group of books, uh, a group of canonical literature called Smirdis. And Smirdis are more or less like the constitutions, books containing instructions and do's and don'ts, which are relevant only for those times, which may be or may not be relevant to our times. For example, let us say, let us think of a book of constitution uh, that is relevant, let us say, around 2000 BC, 4000 years ago. Now, many of those ideas may have some relevance to our times, but many may not have any value or relevance. They are called Smirdis. And I, I want to tell you something very important in this context. Many of the problems of Hindu society that you hear and read about, like casteism, uh, I, mean, uh, the, the, I mean divisiveness at the social level, a large number of people were kept out of the, 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 the periphery of religious and spiritual practices. They were not even allowed to study the Vedas. And uh, there was a lot of uh, inequality and social injustices which, are, which don't exist today. Indian constitution uh, that came into existence after India became independent in 1947. Indian constitution has completely made it illegal to practice many of these teachings which are found in the Smritis. For your information, as a matter of historical interest, some of you may be interested to know, for the first time, many of these ancient law books were translated into English and they became the foundation of Hindu code, Hindu law, and this was done under the British rule. In 18th century, even uh, Sir Warren Hastings became the first Governor General of Bengal. He invited uh, a large number of pandits from different places, and they actually translated many of these smurdis called Vyasa Smurdi, Parasara Smurdi, 
Jabal Smriti, uh, Apastamba Smriti. These are all different names of different sages. Jabala, Apastamba, Parashara. And so these are all different sages who wrote these books. Maybe 3000 BC or maybe even earlier. So he translated many of these into and they formed the Hindu code. So Hindu property succession law, it's called Dayakrama, which is actually Yajnavalki Smurdi and this commentary on Yajnavalki Smurdi called Mitakshara. They all formed the, uh, some of the principles of Hindu law, which uh, were sometimes incorporated in the modern Indian constitution after India became independent. But remember, none of these Smurdis have any any absolute authority in in the life of Hindu people, Hindu population, or uh, in in the uh, in the philosophical structure of Hinduism, many of them may have some value. Many of them do not have any value. They are called smritis, second in authority. The third and the last place goes to Puranas. If you read the Puranas, it's more like reading Homer and Iliad. If you read the Iliad and Odyssey, and if you read the, uh, the works of Homer, you find gods and goddesses coming down to earth, participating in the war between, between the Greeks and Trojans. And some of them help in different groups. More like that. Nobody takes them seriously. So also you find Hindu Puranas. They contain a lot of stories. Kings and dynasties, sages and saints, living for thousands of years, people with, uh, uh, sometimes with the Kartavirya Arjuna. <laughs> Ravana had only ten heads, but there were other wonderful characters in Hindu Purana which had many more heads and hands and feet and so on. Nobody takes them seriously. Now the problem is, many of these books also contain ideas which are very, very divisive. Which, are, which, are, which form the foundations of the practice of inequality, social injustices. A large number of people were kept out of the so, social structure. They were not allowed to participate in any of the religious rituals. So there was a lot of uh, uh, social injustices in those times, which actually became the foundation of this social, in, 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 I mean, called the casteism. Casteism originally was a was a kind of um, a division of labor based on human temperaments, attitudes and behavior patterns. The same family you can have Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya and Sudha. But later when you come to Puranas, all these became very rigid. They became a, a very rigid system based on birth. So, but remember these Puranas have got only the third place in this uh, gradation, of, gradation of Hindu ca canon. Now, sometimes you find many people uh, uh, who, who actually don't know. They will tell you Hinduism means the people, uh, it's stories about kings who live for thousands of years, who did things which are totally irrational. But the point is, the authors of these Puranas and Smurdis themselves clearly stated, don't take us seriously if we, contra if we contradict the teachings of the Vedas, the teachings of the Sudhis. For the first time, this idea was brought for, for the attention of educated people for the first time in modern times of Swami Vivekananda. In 19th century, Swami Vivekananda emerged and he was a man who was steeped in Hindu uh, philosophical, spiritual literature, and also uh, he was a man with an excellent modern education. He again and again reminded uh, modern interpreters of Hinduism and also the common people that you should remember the, f the, the most foundational, the most fundamental authority in philosophical and spiritual and even cultural matters are the Srutis, means, and Sruti again, not the entire Vedas. Samkhidas, Brahmanas, Aranyagas, they don't have the status of permanent value. Vedanta, Upanishads. Because if Upanishads are impersonal, it's called Apaurusheya. Upanishads actually talk about the fundamental human urge for spiritual discovery, spiritual self-discovery. 
and this this fundamental spiritual urge can be found among people in all countries at all times for your information for the first time i'm talking in the context of modern western world for the first time when a man like schopenhauer and then max muller paul dusen and in 20th century he was not an indologist but a journalist uh, paul brunton an american living in in new york when they came in contact with this upanishadic literature the these higher ideas enshrined in the vedantic literature it called shruti yes h r u t i is without diacritical marks of course when they discover these great spiritual uni universal spiritual truths of the vedantic literature they were struck and uh, they found that these constitute essentially the fundamental the universal human aspiration for higher life i am now going to give you three fundamental quotations from three different smriti literature smriti text which tell you don't take us seriously if we contradict the teachings of the upanishads now one is the first one is uh, it is from uh, apastamba smriti apastamba is a great law giver He says, "Yad adrishtam ki vedeshu tad drishtavyam smrdau kila ubabhyam yad adrishtam ki tad puraneshu patthide." So this mudhi puraneshu virudheshu parasparam purvam purvam bili yasya idhi nyaya vidu vidhu. Because this is being recorded, so it will be useful for those who are students of Indian philosophy. Because the problem of studying Indian philosophy is. people don't study these passwords these are passwords if you don't know the password you cannot open your computer so people grab some book from somewhere and they they think hinduism is absolute hinduism is all about stories of uh, gods with uh, different faces and different colors and different so many hands and legs and feet and heads and so on that is not so so this particular uh, uh text tells you wherever you find certain things which are not mentioned in the fundamental essential book in the vedas that is upanishads you can you may get it in the smritis and sometimes if they are not found in the shrutis vedanta or smritis the law books you may find the puranas but remember if there is a contradiction between the teachings injunctions of vedanta or shruti and the law books smritis or puranas then you should accept the teachings of the vedantic books upanishads shrutis as authentic you should discard the, the teachings of smritis and puranas so rational the problem with many religious traditions is they take every comma every word every letter as coming from god and many of those ideas must have been formed during the tribal times thousands of years ago centuries ago they may have had a relevance for those times when society was slowly evolving from tribal to agrarian then industrial and so on urban and so on during this transition from different stages of social evolution man advances human civilization also advances many of the old values become uh, uh, become irrelevant but if you take every word as coming from god there will be a lot of problems lot of you try to impose today what uh, some books which are written maybe 3000 years ago if you interpret them literally in this different century there will be a lot of problems but hinduism does not do that hinduism says you take the fundamental 
universal spiritual teachings, humanistic teachings, which are relevant for all times. And Abhastamba, in his own book, he says, Abhastamba Smudi, he says, you know, my book, my law book may contain many things, perhaps, which contradict the fundamental universal teachings of the Vedas, then you throw me out and you accept what Vedanta teaches. That is the beauty, the charm, the grandeur, the relevance of this text. Second text is from another say, Jab Jabala. His, his name is mentioned in the Upanishad literature, the Chandogya Upanishad, you can find Jabala. Jabala Smurdi is a Smurdi written by this sage, maybe 4000 BC, that is 6000 years ago. And there he says, Sudhi Smudhi Virodeshu, Sudhi Reva Gariyasi, Avirodhe Sada, Avirodhe to Sada Karyam Smartam Vaidika Sada. This is a contradiction between the ideas mentioned in the law books, which are relevant only for those ancient times, and the books which talk about universal, eternal, spiritual ideas then don't take what I say seriously. You listen to the great teachings of the Upanishadic sages, the Sudhis, Vedanta, Vijayavala Smuthi. So they themselves tell you, please kindly don't take me seriously. If I say something that is in contradiction to what the Vedanta tells you. So that means you can take any book and many of the ideas that you find the ancient books may have had a relevance in those times when as I mentioned society was in transition from the early stages of tribalism to agrarian life to industrial life and also in more uh, see urban life for example today 21st century this is 98 whether you accept it or whether you like it or not the world has become one so today whatever you teach should have a relevance for all people in this world, not only for all people, for all creatures. You cannot even neglect the, the, the purity, the preservation of nature, air and water. You cannot even concentrate on the interest that are considered human life alone. You have to extend your thoughts even beyond the, beyond the, uh, uh, the, 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 the human society. The third text is very, so very important. I am just quoting from different authors. It is Sudhi Smudhi Purana Nam Virodho Yetra Dushyadi Tatra Saudam Pramanasya Tayo Devdi Subhidirvara. And so what he says is, this is, a, this is the most important, and this comes from Vyasa. You know who was Vyasa? Vyasa is the one, the great sage, who wrote all the Puranas. And he also wrote Vyasa Smurdi. Smurdi, again we should remember Smurdi, S-M-R-I-T-I, roughly it, it, it corresponds to modern constitutions, books that contain teachings of do's and don'ts for individual life, family life, social life, you can find a Manu Smurdi, Nrupa Dharma, the normal uh, form of contact for a human being, Raja Dharma, Nirbha means king, Raja Dharma, then Nara Dharma for ordinary human beings, Nara Dharma for kings, uh, Raja Dharma or Nirbha Dharma, Grihastha Dharma for householders, and again Yadi Dharma for monks. So there are different uh, rules, do's and don'ts meant for people from different uh, professions, different classes of life. Uh, they have their own duties, do's and don'ts. If you, uh, if you are interested, if you read Buddha's Jardaka Tales, Jardaka Tales, you know, Buddha's uh, rebirth stories, you can find many stories uh, related to people from different walks of life. So you can imagine the concept of uh, different do's and don'ts, uh, course of conduct which are prevalent in, in, in different social circles. So, Vyasa is the one, is the great author who wrote 36 huge books 
എയ്റ്റീൻ മഹാപുരാണാസ് എയ്റ്റീൻ ഉപപുരാണാസ് എയ്റ്റീൻ ഫണ്ടമെൻ്റൽ മിത്തോളജിക്കൽ ബുക്സ് മഹാപുരാണാസ് ആൻഡ് ദെൻ സബ്സിഡിയറി മിത്തോളജിക്കൽ ബുക്സ് ഉപപുരാണാസ് തേർട്ടി സി തേർട്ടി സിക്സ് യു നീഡ് യു നീഡ് വൺ ഫുൾ ഷെൽഫ് ടു അറേഞ്ച് ഓൾ ദീസ് ബുക്സ് ആൻഡ് ഈസ് ദ വൺ ഹു ആക്ച്വലി ക്ലാസിഫൈഡ് വേദ വേദാസ് ഇൻ ടു സംഹിത അരണ്യക ബ്രാഹ്മണ ഉപനിഷത്ത് ആൻഡ് സോൺ ആൻഡ് ഈ ഓൾസോ റോട്ട് എ റോട്ട് എ ബുക്ക് ഓഫ് ലോ വ്യാസ സ്മൃതി ഇൻ ദാറ്റ് സ്മൃതി ഹി സേസ് ശ്രുതി സ്മൃതി വിരോധ ശ്രുതി സ്മൃതി പുരാണാനാം വിരോധോ എത്ര ദൃശ്യതെ തത്ര സൗദം പ്രമാണം സ്യാൽ ത്വയോദ്വൈതി സ്മൃതി ദ്വാര ഹി സേസ് ശ്രുതി സ്മൃതി ആൻഡ് പുരാണാസ് ഇത് ഇസ് എ കോൺട്രഡിക്ഷൻ ബിറ്റ്വീൻ ശ്രുതീസ് ആൻഡ് സ്മൃതീസ് ശ്രുതീസ് ആർ ഇമ്പോർട്ടൻറ്റ് ഓത്തൻറ്റിക് ഇത് ഇസ് എ കോൺട്രഡിക്ഷൻ ബിറ്റ്വീൻ സ്മൃതീസ് ആൻഡ് പുരാണാസ് ദെൻ സ്മൃതീസ് ആർ ഇമ്പോർട്ടൻറ്റ് പുരാണാസ് ഷുഡ് ബി ഡിസ്കാർഡഡ് ദീസ് is a statement that comes from the author of this smriti called vyasa smriti now one question arises what are these universal fundamental teachings as i mentioned sudhis if you read the upanishads brihadaranika chandokya and so on you find there are many stories there are many anecdotes there are many parables all of them should not be taken as fundamental they do have a place and importance but there are certain teachings which are which actually uh, give a picture of our journey in spiritual space of course there are long passages in the chandogya and brigharanika in the isha kena katha prashna mundaka mandukya taittiri aitai and so on which are commented by shankaracharya they contain some stories the stories perhaps do not have any eternal value but there are some fundamental teachings in all these which are of eternal relevance that's why when shopen how read it he thought this is the story of human aspirations in spiritual life when max muller started reading it he never looked back 40 years he dedicated his entire life to study and write about these books paul dusen and so on. not just but many 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 because when you read these upanishads you find oh this is my own story this is my own story many of these teachings were interpreted by commentators so in indian philosophical tradition this i only mentioned this earlier there is a close connection between spirituality religion on on the one hand and philosophy on the other you cannot really separate one from the other in indian context see in western philosophical context for example jays mill his faith has absolutely nothing to do with what he taught kant immanuel kant whatever religion he practiced maybe he did not practice any religion whether he went to the church regularly or not it has nothing at all to do with what he wrote absolutely no no connection absolutely no justification to connect one with the other but in indian context if ramanuja writes a bhashya is a commentary on gita then you look for his life and you find that he was actually writing uh, poetry in praise of the god whom he depicted in his philosophical books so uh, theology spirituality and philosophy they are all intertwined so in the four four vedas there are four great statements they constitute the essence of india's vedantic or philosophical spiritual philosophical tradition four fundamental statements they are called mahavakya these mahavakyas actually uh, will uh, will show us the natural human aspiration and our journey in in search of our own spiritual self discovery there are four in number one is in the shukla yajur veda in the brihara nirvanishad you have got this aham brahmasmi 
ಇಂಡಿ ಸಾಮವೇದ ಇನ್ ದ ಛಾಂದೋಗ್ಯ ಉಪನಿಷದ್ ಯು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಗೋಟ್ ತತ್ವ ಮಸಿ ದೀಸ್ ಆರ್ ಟೂ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಮಹಾವಾಕ್ಯ ದರ್ ಆರ್ ಟೂ ಮೋರ್ ಆಫ್ ದೀಸ್ ದ ಲೇಟರ್ ಒನ್ ತತ್ವ ಮಸಿ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಅನ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟ್ರಕ್ಷನ್ ವಾಟ್ ಡಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಸೇ ದ ಟ್ರೂತ್ ಟು ಗಾಡ್ ದ ಡಿವೈನ್ ಸ್ಪಾರ್ಕ್ that you are searching for it is within you it is you yourself but not this body not this mind if you think of if you can contemplate on what is my true nature what am i beyond my body beyond my mind beyond my beyond my intellect that divine spirit that all pervading spirit that atman this is you yourself this is an instruction that comes from uh, a teacher called uh, uddalaga given to his own son and disciple shwetakedu it is spread over uh, the entire 6th uh, chapter of chandogya upanishad which is from the samaveda tradition which is uh, the 6th chapter has got 16 sections khandas of which from 9 to 16 this is discussed in each section of that text you are that spiritual truth it means you can go to temple or church okay but eventually you will find your god is within you there is a divine spirit within you you manifest that inner divinity this is being discussed and this is the most vital the most crucial most fundamental instruction in the entire vedic literature anyone who is reading this whether you believe in god or not even if you are a civilized uh, a refined human being you will immediately connect with that because i should really find out my own true nature this is called the instruction of uh, the e- e- instruction given to a disciple a, a, a statement of instruction is called upadesha vakya in sanskrit means a statement of instruction now the later one which i mentioned is aham brahmasmi that that corresponds to a person's real inner experience self discovery as a result of long practices of meditation contemplation and so on he realizes that he am, well i am that divine spirit during this interval between instruction and experience there are there are different stages of evolution that is called lakshana vakya is the prajnanam brahma and ayam atma brahma it is all it comes from the atharva veda imandukya upanishad it is called anu, anu, it is called anusandhana vakya so you contemplate on certain fundamental teachings and you you uh, start on your spiritual journey as a result of this you get this aham brahmasmi experience now just giving one example now we will come to uh, we will come back to the 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 area of uh, canonical literature now in in vedantic tradition one important thing i mentioned last time you know uh, there are different schools of vedanta and after uh, giving an outline of the 12 systems of indian philosophy broadly speaking broad divisions that is six astiga or orthodox systems of philosophy and six nastiga or the non orthodox or heterodox systems of indian philosophy in astiga tradition in in orthodox tradition there is purva mimamsa of jaimini uttara mimamsa of badrayana then sankhya yoga sankhya of kapila yoga of patanjali the nyaya and vaisheshika uh, nyaya of, uh, uh, of gautama and vaisheshika philosophy of kanada six system and then uh, among the non orthodox or heterodox or nastika system of philosophy we have jainism then indian materialism the vicharvaga system and then we have the four schools of buddhism sautrantika and vaibhashika which are realistic schools belong to belonging to the hinayana tradition and the yogacara and shunyavada belonging to the mahayana system 
which called idealist schools of philosophy. These are six, these are dual systems of philosophy. In in addition to all this, there are many fringe groups, innumerable schools of Indian philosophy. Some philosophical systems based on uh, word, letter, nespoorda, which I which I will discuss uh, later on. Now coming back to Vedanta, which is our first uh, uh, and in the initial subject of discussion, Vedanta. In the Vedantic tradition, there are altogether uh, uh, more than seven uh, distinct schools of Vedanta. The most prominent and the most important and most well-known, maybe the only well-known Vedantic schools in the Western world is the school of Advaita or non-dualism, Shankaracharya. He was born in the 8th century and he his, according to his system, the absolute reality is one divine spark which is beyond names and forms and attributes. Not devoid of names and forms, but beyond. Not limited by names and forms, but transcending everything. Uh, cannot be called by a specific name, doesn't mean it doesn't have a name. It means beyond definitions, beyond descriptions. It is a matter of our own inner experience. Truth is one and uh, the absolute reality is that all-pervading reality. And essentially our true nature and absolute reality are the same. It doesn't mean, again there's a lot of misunderstandings in this. Those of you who are interested, I have given a number of lectures in the New Temple, I mean the evolution of Advaita. You can listen to them. There are many misunderstandings. The Shankara taught you that we are all gods. No. What Shankara taught was, within you, there is something that is beyond body, mind and intellect. That divine spark. That is one. That is all pervading. That is present in everyone, everything. So, that is the essence of Brahma Satyam Jagad Mithya Jivo Brahma Ivanabara. These teachings of Advaita or non-dualistic system of philosophy, which is the most prominent and most popular system of Vedanta. The second one is Visistha Advaita, even qualified non-dualism. According to, uh, according to uh, Ramanuja Acharya, uh, God has got uh, innumerable attributes, qualities, names and so on. It is a, it is a devotional system of philosophy. The third one is dualism, Madhu Acharya, uh, he, he belonged to 13th century, sometimes a little earlier, and he believed uh, that there is a fundamental difference between, uh, between God and us, between uh, the world and us, and among the different spirit seekers there is a fundamental difference, I mean difference uh, among things in the world different, uh, a fundamental, unbreakable, unbreachable difference between different spiritual seekers, different uh, uh, creatures in the world and in other words called Panja Bheda Siddhanta, everything is different from everything else. This is his, part, his teaching. Of course, the sec then, then we had Nimbarka who lived in the 12th and 13th century. He also is called Dvaita Dvaita. And then we have Vallabhacharya, Suddha Dvaita. He belonged to 15th or 16th century. 16th century we have got Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And the 19th century we have got, of course, a group called Swaminara and sect, which is actually a kind of uh, devotional system of philosophy, which is perhaps uh, more or less based on temple ritual worship and so on. So this is the picture of Vedantic tradition. Now, again, one important thing to remember. In Sanskrit, there are certain technical names by which uh, these philosophers' fundamental views are uh, named or defined. For example, you know, according to Advaita, Advaitinam Brahma Nimitta Vadana Karnaha, means uh, Advaitins believe, non dualistic philosophers believe that uh, Brahman. The absolute reality is the material cause and also the efficient cause of this world. I mean, the world itself 
is nothing but an appearance. Uh, appearance doesn't mean that it is absolutely non-existent. It means when you realize your own true nature, then you realize the fundamental unity and oneness of existence. Then you don't differentiate things in terms of names and forms. Then you realize the fundamental unity and oneness of existence. Then the ancient philosophers, Sankhyas, I mean, who follow the path of Kapila and Isha Krishna, they believed in a kind of evolution. There's Indian evolutionary, Indian school of evolution, it's called Karinamavada. They believed in two fundamental categories, that is Purusha, which is self-effulgent, and Prakriti, which is non-effulgent. And everything in this world is an evolute of that Prakriti. It's called Prathana. It's called Prathana Parinamavada. That we'll discuss in course of time. Then, of course, there are other schools, Vaisheshigas and Nayayigas. Vaisheshigas, you may call them Indian, uh, at, it's called Indian atomism. Uh, the school was founded by a great saint called Kanada. He believed that everything that exists in the world is independent. Uh, uh, to give an example, a, a piece of cloth which is actually coming from threads, or let us say a mud pot which is coming from mud. According to this school, Vaisheshika school, Kanada school, they will tell you this mud pot has a distinct name and its distinct form. Therefore, it is essentially different and distinct from the mud from which it is made. And they believe that because the mud pot is used for a purpose other than the purpose of mud. Or give another example, let us say a, a, a necklace, a ring made from gold, let us say. They will tell you when the gold becomes a golden ring, it gets a new shape and it gets a new name. So Nama and Rupa, Nama means name, Rupa means shape or form. And therefore we use it for a different purpose. We don't use gold for wearing in your, as, as an ornament, you don't do that. So uh, it, it, it is a new existence, a new creation, it's a new product, new effect, they will say. It's called Arambhavada, means the doctrine that tells you that anything uh, uh, that comes from a cause is essentially different from the cause. Effect and cause are two different things. Every effect signifies the emergence of a new entity. To understand this, it's opposite what we, we can say. There, for example, the Sankhyas, and of course Vedantins also will tell you. They will tell you that the effect pre-existing cause. For example, the golden ring pre-exists in gold. A clay cup, a cup made of clay, pre-exists in the clay. Why? Because you remove all the clay from a clay pot, you won't find any pot in there. You cannot, you remove all the gold from a golden ring, there is no more golden ring available. So they will tell you that the effect pre-exists in cause. It's called, uh, uh, it, it's the opposite of Parinamavada. It's the opposite of it. It's called Satkaryavada, which means the effect already uh, pre-existing in cause. Why say Shigas and Nehayas will tell you, no, the effect is something new. Then there are, of course, different schools of Buddhism, but there is a fundamental theory that unifies them all. They believe in, uh, in, in, in everything is momentary, momentariness. And they interpret momentariness in different terms. According to Sautrantikas and Vaibhashikas, Vijnanavadins, Sunyavadins, which we we'll discuss in course of time. Then you may have heard of a school called Jainas. You know, the, many, many, most of you may be at least familiar with vegan food. The vegan food is actually, we should thank the Jainas for, that's what I'm told, I'm, I'm given to understand that these 
vegan food originates from Jaina tradition because they don't eat anything. Uh, they are they are cutthroat, absolute vegetarians, more like me, though I am not a Jaina. So the point is, they believe in Syagvada. They it's a it's school of philosophy which is which is well known for its indecisive nature. I mean, they they accept different options. Then, of course, there are other schools, you know, Pashupadamada. I mean, there are those who believe in the doctrine that the Pashupadi interpretation of Shiva is the fundamental reality. Everything is actually uh, caused by by a creator God. It's more like more like modern monotheistic theories. Now, I'm just giving an outline. This is just a, this an outline. Now, coming to the real subject, I already mentioned earlier that the most fundamental um, uh, canon or canonical literature in Indian philosophy, Indian spirituality, Indian culture, even in the area of performing rituals, for example, elaborate rituals, the most fundamental authority are the Vedas. These Vedas themselves have got different uh, different uh, forms. You may ask this question. Uh, it's a very ancient civilization, ancient country, uh, densely populated uh, country, uh, which is very ancient, which used to be very fertile. So many rivers, so many, so many groups, and so many uh, cultural traditions. So, uh, how could they maintain all this? And I should mention now at this stage, the very, very important thing. In Indian tradition, you find every age produces a new interpreter, a new exponent of the fundamental truths of Vedas, Vedic teachings. To give an example, you can read Swami Vivekananda's well-known lecture. You can find it in, in the category of Colombo to Almora lectures. A lecture that Swami Vivekananda gave in South India, addressing an audience, called Sages of India. It's a very fairly long lecture. When Swamiji returned from the West, even he returned to India, he, he traveled all the way from Colombo to Almora. So it's called Colombo to Almora lectures. It may be the part of the third volume of Swamiji's complete, Swami Vivekananda's complete works. It's called Sages of India. In this lecture, Swami Vivekananda uh, makes some very important observations which are of great interest, should be of great interest to all students of Indian philosophy. Swamiji says that, Swami Vivekananda actually gives a list of great teachers who emerged in India from time to time. All the way from ancient times to Rama and Krishna, then Buddha, then Shankaracharya, then Ramanuja, and Madhva and then Chaitanya and coming to our own times. His own teacher, the great teacher of 19th century, Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa and so on. So Vivekananda says, these great teachers called, they are called Acharyas, some of them called Avatars. You may call them incarnations or you may call them great teachers. What they did, they did not give you something new. Rather, what they did was, they took the best from the ancient Vedic literature. Then they reinterpreted those teachings to make them suitable to their own times and passed over to the next generation. For example, if you read Vivekananda's complete works, what you find is nothing but a new modern interpretation of certain eternal truths in a language and vocabulary that is suitable, intelligible to his times, people who are living in the later half of 19th century. When he traveled to India, so traveled all over India and then to Europe and also to the United States. So he found a new world, a world was totally different from the world that Shankaracharya saw in 8th century, a world totally different from the world that Buddha encountered in the 6th century BC. But what he did was, even Lord Krishna, 
in the Bhagavad Gita, he actually expounds the same great truths, third millennium BC. Now, but the world had become different, the world has ch had changed, human civilization had changed, values have changed. So what Vivekananda did, according to him and his own words, he says, I preach nothing but the Upanishads. That's it. After uh, traveling all over the world, after giving, uh, after bring, uh, founding this great organization like Ramakrishna Mission, after expounding Vedanta in the, in the new, in modern times, what he did, I preach nothing but the Upanishads. Let's see, there's something very, very important for us to remember. So that's what every great Indian teacher does. He, uh, he takes the best from mentioned Upanishadic tradition, the eternal spiritual truths, the eternal spiritual philosophical truths, which are relevant for all times. And then he, uh, uh, he analyzes, he practices in his life, and he reinterprets without changing even a little bit of the ancient fundamental principles, but changing the language, the method of interpretation, the examples and parables, using the language of his own times. That's what every great teacher did and does in India. See, if you look at Vivekananda, he is at one end of the spectrum. At the other end, you can Buddha, 6th century BC, between these two, Shankaracharya, 8th century AD. All the great teachers, what Buddha did, according to Vivekananda was, Buddha took up these great eternal truths of the Upanishads and gave them a more a, a humanistic, you may call it a more pragmatic interpretation, because that was the need of the hour of his times. The same thing Shankaracharya did, the same thing all the great philosophers did. And that that called that is called Acharya Parambara or Avatara. I mean Acharya Parambara means succession, an unbroken lineage of succession of great teachers who preserve, who sustains, who protects these eternal truths by putting the old wine in new bottle new label, but the same great truths are preached. So what we are reading today in Vivekananda's uh, words, he refers to Kant, Hegel, Spinoza, and so on, all modern. He even refers to socialism, you find <laughs> in Vivekananda's lectures, you find. But he's actually talking about the great eternal truths about which Shankaracharya, spoke, which Shankaracharya expounded, which Buddha expounded, which Lord Krishna in 3rd millennium BC expounded in the Bhagavad Gita. So, those who are interested uh, to know this, this lineage of succession, you can read the Sages of India, Vivekananda's famous lecture in the complete books. So, now coming to the subject. Now, uh, first of all, we should know there are four Vedas. Each of these Vedas, I got Samkhida, Brahmana, Aranyaka and Upanishad. The great statements that I refer to, for example, Tattumasi is from Samaveda, Aham Brahmasmi is from Yajurveda, and Ayamatma Brahma is from Atharvaveda, is the Mandukya Upanishad, and Prajnanam Brahma is from Aitireya, it is from Rigveda. So, each of these four Vedas, uh, as, as Four divisions, Brahmana, Samhita, Brahmana, Aranyaka and Upanishad. And again, each of these Vedas have got Vedangas, certain auxiliary branches of learning called phonetics, grammar, prosody, etymology, astronomy and the science of rituals. It's called Siksha, <coughs> Vyagaranam, Chandas, Niruktam, Jyodisham and Kalpa. These are things that should be studied. Now, one may ask this question, where is the time to spend your whole lifetime to study all this? You study the Upanishads. That's enough. 
Actually, you don't have to go through unless you feel an inner call to dedicate your whole life to study this. One should not, one cannot even think of even reading any of this. For, so four Vedas, each of the Vedas got four divisions. There is some Hida, Brahmana, Aranyaka and Upanishad. And then six Vedangas. That is Shiksha, Vyagranam, Chandasa, Niruptam, Jyodisham and Kalpa. That means phonetics. I say phonetics are very important those of you are interested. Phonetics was a highly developed science of, uh, in ancient times. Naradiya Siksha, Panini Siksha, even the art of pronunciation, even the art of using words and sentences in a refined manner, in a manner that gives you a kind of inner fulfillment and that gives others a sense of inner fulfillment when they listen to you. One interesting expression is there, I think most probably is in Panini Siksha, he says, a proper word used with propriety is the greatest contribution, greatest heritage you can think of for yourself. Maybe it's a bit too much, but then the purity, the art of refinement of language, so phonetics. And you have to remember Daniel Jones wrote the pronunciation of English, of course, Fortunately, in America, it's not so very popular. Daniel Jones and Jimson, together, they, uh, they developed what they call a kind of civilized pronunciation <laughs> called RP. That's only in the early decades of 20th century, which Americans fortunately don't care much for, of course. And in modern times, maybe Chomsky and many other linguists may have give, given some thoughts to refinement language. So, Panini, Yesiksha, Naradi Yesiksha, all these great works on Sanskrit phonetics belong to 3rd millennium BC. <coughs> Remember. So that is funny. Then grammar. Grammar, that's also Panini is also the author of the fundamental book Rashtadhyayi with eight chapters. The discovery of which was a turning point in the history of modern philology and modern linguistics in the Western world. The Western world's encounter with Ashtadhyayi, Sanskrit grammatical work, was a turning point. It brought a revolution in the entire field of philology and linguistics. Then Chandas, that is prosody, uh, different meters, and then of course etymology. It's actually partly linked to grammar. It's called Niruktam. Yaska was the great sage who wrote the book Niruptam, etymology of different words. They, for example, one word, God, G-O-D, not G capital G, but G-O-D, small, gods and goddesses. More like angels, let's say parallel in Christian tradition. So called Deva. So Devo, Dhanadva, Devanadva, Diodanadva, Pavadidi. So the word Deva can mean somebody who listens to your prayers and gives you what you are asking for. Or Dustano Vad, one one there, mean who is staying in the heavenly region, celestial beings. Like that, each word, uh, not all the way words in the Veda, but a small collection of so Vedic mantras are taken by Yaska and he wrote a well known book called Etymology. It's called Yaskas Nirukta. Then there is astrology. Sorry, it's called astronomy and astrology. Both are interrelated. Vedic astrology and astronomy are closely related. And then we have Kalpas. A whole book dedicated to the science of performing different rituals, their details, their methods and so on. And then <coughs> we have also uh, this, you know, this uh, philosophy of rituals called Puramimamsa, higher philosophy, Upanishadic philosophy, Uttaramimamsa, that we talk Vedanta. Then, in addition to that, we have these Itihasas, more, they are a bit mystery and also a lot of mythology, Ramayana, Mahabharata. And of course, then we have 18 
ഫണ്ടമെൻ്റൽ മിത്തോളജിക്കൽ ബുക്സ് കോൾഡ് മഹാപുരാണാസ് എ എയ്റ്റീൻ ഉപപുരാണാസ് സെക്കൻഡറി മിത്തോളജിക്കൽ ബുക്സ് സോ ദ പോയിൻ്റ് ഈസ് വാട്ട് ഇറ്റ് സേസ് ഈസ് ദ ഹ്യൂജ് ബ്രാഞ്ച് ഓഫ് ലിറ്ററേച്ചർ ഐ മേ സംബഡി മേ ആസ് ദിസ് ക്വസ്റ്റിൻ വാട്ട് ഈസ് ദ റെലവൻസ് ഓഫ് ഓൾ ദീസ് ടു അവർ ടൈംസ് വെൽ in one respect the question is very logical <coughs> one should be in modern times one should be uh, very careful about spending time and energy the point is when you take up a philosophical system when you take a religious faith system whatever it is you can use your own independent thought you, you your own powers of independent reasoning perfectly okay but it is also important to understand that system of philosophy from the perspective of the culture where it originated so for example when i try to understand the christian theology when i try to read augustine and aquinas actually only in english translation what i should do if i am a sensible person i should try to understand and then i should also try to respect the traditional hierarchical interpretation of augustine and aquinas from their own perspectives from the tra- their own traditional ecclesiastical hierarchical catholic perspective i should not ignore it i cannot just read one book and say this is the right real meaning without actually understanding the language or the tradition or the culture background of the book where it was written this is this is on the one hand it is minimum decency on the other hand it is an intellectual integrity and honesty so it is imp- it is very important for us to understand this lineage this tradition this code called parampara the succession of great teachers so uh, that is true of buddhism christianity judaism all these great faith systems which have got their own huge philosophical literature because the this heritage is the treasure of human civilization this is an important thing to remember if you if you disinherit yours if you disown your own heritage if you have got let us say 1 billion dollar in the bank and due to some uh, delusions you start thinking i am a pauper and you start living uh, in the middle of a street asking hey, anything will do you you, uh, you end up being uh, asking for you asking you end up begging in the streets forgetting the fact that you have 1 billion dollar in the bank that is a kind of cultural suicide so also these great uh, treasure houses of hinduism which are now mostly enshrined in the innumerable libraries manuscript libraries uh which is very important for us to remind ourselves of these vast treasure houses which constitute um uh, the priceless heritage civilizational intellectual spiritual and philosophical heritage of humanity as uh, western indologists began to discover right from the uh, middle of 18th century onwards so thank you now we can have interaction you are most welcome uh, with questions thank you yeah oh you had two questions yeah most well. mentioned that the vedas were organized in samhita ramana aranyaka upanishad yeah. i have seen a citation for instance aitreya upanishad is in the rigveda Dutiya Aitreya Aranyaka. Yeah. Is, uh, you know, I, I, I must say a few things in this connection, you know. It is believed that Vedas were just one, and that is the view of traditional scholars. Um, uh, these Vedas were divided into four distinct schools, like Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Sama Veda, and Atharva Veda by Vyasa. Uh, uh, actually, it is wrong to say classically, Vyasa Dhadu means, root means, editing so most probably he must have classified them into four 
branches and each tradition came to be known as Rigvedic, Rigveda Parambara, the tradition of Rigveda, Yajurveda, Samaveda, Antharveda, which again uh, got subdivided in course of time. So uh, when you talk about history, it's very difficult. That's a problem with, uh, with Indian society or Hindu society in general. They were not uh, very much historic, history oriented, you know. So you don't find um, the, the exact. Historians have different views. Uh, there are historians who will uh, who tell you that Rigveda just belongs to, it just about uh, 2000 BC, but uh, it's very difficult to believe because the Rigveda Samkhita, for example, um, there are mantras which uh, talk about uh, river Saraswati as a living river. Vyasa is said to have being, uh, Vyasa, he was sitting on the, ban the, the banks of river Saraswati. The Saraswati was a living river uh, perhaps 15,000 years ago, 13,000 BC. That's the, because according to modern geologists, the river disappeared. Uh, of course, it is something that you, anyone can find out from its source, different geological sources. So, very difficult to pinpoint the exact uh, line of demarcation in terms of history. But what we can do, we have to, please, 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 we have to find some kind of a, uh, find a compromise between extreme ultra-modern historians who want to push everything forward to make Egyptian history look older. There's a, there's a trend, unfortunately, which happened after the French Indologist, sorry, French Egyptologist that discovered Egyptian civilization, there was deliberate, the deliberate attempt to uh, push Egyptian civilization forward. But, uh, but later historians, later, you know, reacted. Now that trend is gone. So, it, what, it, it, it's best to say that uh, the Vedas, as we find today, are at least uh, 4,000, 5,000 BC. That's roughly you can say. This certain historical record is not known. When somebody announces his genius, actually, he, please tell me. Yeah, yeah. He says he, you know, he has certain Rishipravara, Gotra, Sutra, and Shaka. So the Sutra names are they seem to be coinciding with the Smritis that you mentioned: Hapastamba Sutra, Ashwalayana, Godayana Sutra, etc. The Sutra, yeah. I presume, is different, different than Smriti. It doesn't say I'm a subscriber. To <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sutras are with the Kalpa. Sutras belong to Kalpa tradition, different ways of performing the Vedic ritual, yajnas and yagas and so on. So many of the sages wrote uh, books on Kalpas also. So Kalpa Sutras belonging to Avastamba and others are there. But uh, Avastamba is also well known for his Smurdi. So, so these Kalpas, Kalpa Sutras are timeless. They are not like Smurdi bound to certain times. They are not timeless because they are all related to uh, the performance of rituals and those rituals are not the fundamental uh, essence of Vedanta. Rituals are, are subject to changes. This is one, one serious problem, you know. Very often in our understanding of Vedanta or Indian philosophy, we put so much of rituals and Puranas into the front. With the result, uh, philosophy takes a, a back seat. Every time a great teacher like Krishna, you know, you find in the in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna doesn't mince words when he criticizes extreme ritualists. Ekshe dasya mi modishe itya jnana vi mohakidaha. Not very pleasant, not very pleasant words or invectives he uses. Strong language criticizing extreme ritualists. Now, Kalpa Sutras are related to rituals. So why should Kalpa Sutras be considered to be very important? It's an important thing to remember. Yeah, but you mentioned that Adi Shankar did not, he did not ridicule. Adi uh, okay, so uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Adi Shankara did not ridicule anything, but he ridiculed the idea of the Mimamsagas who used to who used to argue that every person has to perform these rituals. It's just like saying that a man of 60 years, a college professor, also should eat candies. Rituals are just eating candies. What are the prayers uttered when you perform the rituals? 
പശ്ചിമ ശരതശ്രിതം ജീവമ ശരതശ്രിതം ഭൂയശ ശരതശ്രതാ ലെറ്റ് മീ ലീവ് ഫോർ ഹൺഡ്രഡ് ഇയേഴ്സ് ലെറ്റ് മീ ബി എബിൾ ടു സ്പീക്ക് ഫോർ ഹൺഡ്രഡ് ഇയേഴ്സ് ലെറ്റ് മീ എബിൾ ടു സീ ഫോർ ഹൺഡ്രഡ് ഇയേഴ്സ് ഓൾ ദീസ് പ്രയേഴ്സ് ഫോർച്ചുനേറ്റ്ലി മെനി പീപ്പിൾ ഡോൺ നോ ദ മീനിങ് ഓഫ് ദ മന്ത്രാസ് വിത്ത് വിച്ച് ദർ അട്രിങ് ദി വിത്ത് ദർ റിച്വൽസ് ആസ്കിംഗ് ഫോർ മോർ വെൽത്ത് ഇറ്റ് ജസ്റ്റ് ലൈക്ക് ആസ്കിംഗ് ഫോർ കാൻഡീസ് ദാറ്റ്സ് വൈ ഇറ്റ് ഇസ് ഇമ്പോർട്ടൻറ്റ് ഫോർ യു ടു ലിസൺ ടു വിവേകാനന്ദ ഹു കെയിം in our own times he is not against temples but he wanted people to think beyond temples he was not against rituals but he wanted to uh, make people remind people about thinking beyond temples the same thing shankaracharya did so if rituals are done with the right mindset keeping the ultimate goal in mind it's okay you know rich if if you really perform any ritual with uh, with a pure heart without selfish motive then one day you will realize yeah, i should go beyond this the, the very fact that people do not be, go beyond rituals the reason is they are doing performing rituals with great aspiration great desire if you perform rituals without any desire then you will transcend rituals you don't feel the need to perform rituals that's the idea behind you will go beyond the candies that's the idea behind okay now any other question most welcome you should always remember none of our great vedantin sages ever criticized rituals this is an important thing they only criticized the idea that rituals alone constitute the essence of religion that's an important thing to remember none of the great philosophers sages all the way from lord krishna to our own time vivekananda or shridamushna ramana maharshi anyone you take none of them ever criticized rituals as such but they criticized the the idea that religion begins with rituals it ends with rituals that they discarded that's an important thing please continue please david please you want to say something swami swami uh, i i if i remember correctly i think swami vivekananda's favorite upanishad was the kata upanishad um i'm wondering why he chose that one to be his favorite oh yeah i think kathopanishu swami ji uh, chose that for one very important reason he uh, he admired one important quality uh, that were uh, of nachiketa the 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 main protagonist the main character in the kathopanish his shraddha the shraddha is a sanskrit word which swami ji says cannot be translated into english shraddha means shraddha you can say if you can uh, put together integrity honesty sincerity truthfulness Uh, uh all these qualities your uh, your you your ability to identify with what you believe in what you are doing with 100% sincerity that swami ji found in nachiketa the main character the student uh, uh, kathopanishad and also uh, in the kathopanishad the teacher uh, yama also admired this and vivekananda wanted the siddha to be taken up as a great national ideal when swami ji addressed uh, uh, people in india during his lecture tour you find swami ji again and again repeats the important he emphasizes the importance of siddha if you got siddha then you get everything so in the kathopanishad there is about siddha avivesha Najiketa Najiketa was possessed by Siddha you can imagine the strength the force of the expression so if you are possessed by sincerity that is a far more powerful expression than saying he is very sincere totally different you you are possessed by sincerity you are possessed by Siddha Siddha avivesha pido daga jagdagruna dugda doha nirindriya hale that the kathopanisha there is a statement where um, uh, nachiketa the little boy found out the, the tricks played by his own father 
His father was supposed to give whatever was precious, what all his precious wealth. But instead of giving away useful things, his father was giving away cows uh, which are uh, absolutely useless, which can't give milk, which can't eat food, which may be burdened to anyone who gets them. So Nachiketa saw from a distance, he says, uh, He became possessed. So it is not sincerity alone. There are many more things, integrity, honesty, uh, 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 I mean, an urge for the right thing, all these qualities. So, that sadha is an important theme discussed in the Kathopanishad. So, Swamiji himself wanted uh, that this sadha to be taken up as an ideal by Indians. That is the immediate context. But in the broader sense, you find even in, 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 during his conversation with Sister Nivedida, Swamiji talks about the sadha of Nachiketa. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Uh, yeah namaskar. Uh, what does uh, what what do Hindu scriptures say about proselytization and conversion? Well, Hinduism is essentially a non-proselytizing religion, but it doesn't it doesn't uh, uh, forbid uh, you when you want to become a Hindu, but it is it doesn't go about proselytization. Now, uh, you people, I mean, you find different groups in Hindu the tradition, they spread their ideas of God, but they don't formally ask you to give up their religion and come and become a Hindu. They don't do that. It is almost unknown in Hindu tradition. They never do that. They may ask you take, to take up one mantra or to perform, or to go to a temple, they may, but they won't ask you, uh, they won't talk about, they won't criticize other religions. Because a Hindu generally, an ideal Hindu can never think that any other religion can be wrong. If we go to India, for example, you find, today you find less of them, but I know when I was very small, uh, uh, in fact, one of the uh, Vedic rituals performed, in which actually uh, Atiratra was performed, um, just witnessed by Fritz Stahl, who was a professor of Vedas in the, in the Berkeley Center University. I was close to my own place. So you find there, are, there were many uh, great Vedic scholars. Uh, you See, if you talk to them about other faith systems or religious uh, ideas, oh, it is their own way. But they were never criticized that any other path is wrong. That's an important thing, you know. E comes up with Prabhudhavadanti. Bhudhavadanti means truth is one, but people call them, approach those truths from different angles. So that Rigveda statement in the first mandala itself it comes, you know. That is the underlying principle of Hinduism. Hinduism is in a, it's a totally non proselytizing religion. Even if People from other traditions flock to different groups, different cults within Hinduism. Hindus never tell them that path is wrong, so you come over to thy side. They never, they will never call other ideas of God as satanic or wrong or evil. No, such a person cannot be a Hindu because that is the that is di diametrically opposite to the teachings of the Vedas. That's an important thing to remember. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ashwin, please go ahead and ask your question. Yeah. Namaste, Swamiji. Namaste. Um, thank you for the lecture. So I have this um, like big, uh, like very broad question, which is a lot of these philosophies, be it Buddhist, be it Jaina, and even within like... Um, uh, the Vedantic ones, uh, Madhva, Ramanuja, Shankara. Why is it that we have so many different philosophies? Like, is there something like an absolute thing, or is everything relative in some sense? Like, yeah, I'm just trying to understand why there are these many different ways to explain, let's say, an absolute truth. You know, the one one important reason is there was no hierarchy within Hinduism. 
which forbade people from asking questions. This is an important thing to remember. So, the sheer diversity of different philosophical schools in Hinduism. I mean, you have to remember, India is a densely populated country with total freedom for thought. If, if you go to this, uh, uh, this temple, so any of the temples in the Bay Area, they won't ask you, you should stand, you should only go to Shiva and don't care for Vishnu. You can go or you don't go to go. Important thing to remember. The total freedom. Why total freedom? Again, Ekam Sat Vipra Bhaguda Vadandi. Truth is one, but the truth can have different roads that will take you there. That fundamental thesis of Hinduism is behind this. This, it doesn't mean that every person is aware of this statement from Rigveda Samhita, but it became a cultural undertone. It became a cultural landscape for every person. That's an important thing. That was why it became a totally non-proselytizing religion. Secondly, they never thought of any other religion as being wrong. It's an important thing. As for the diversity of philosophical, so you should you should either celebrate diversity. That's an important thing. See, have you see if you go to Ajanta and Ellora, if you go to the ancient Buddhist uh, caves, temples, or if you go to Laos, Cambodia, uh, China, Japan, Korea, so all these countries, you could see better. You find uh, pictures of different versions of Buddha. Some Buddha got a huge pot belly. <laughs> you can imagine, smiling all the time. People don't ask the question, why do you have a Buddha who looks so pot belly, with the pot belly and smiling? They don't bother. So you find this idea, uh, I mean, even while worshipping a great man Buddha, like Buddha, they could think beyond the rigidity of one specific method, one rigid method which alone should be accepted and everything else should be rejected. Second reason that you, for, for, for second answer, it's a very important answer is Hindu religious tradition was not founded by a single individual. It is an evolved religion and not a revealed religion in the normal sense in which Abrahamic religions are considered to be revealed religions. So, all the truth was revealed to these sages in different places. They worship, they uh, experience in the, so many different ways. So, it was not founded by a single individual. To give an example, you know, when, uh, when, when uh, uh, the, the temple, the Jerusalem temple was destroyed by invaders in 51 AD, they came to India. And what the king did, he, oh, you are coming from different place, all right, you want to worship, all right, take this temple. He gave some temples and villages and asked them, you perform your worship in this manner. Then in the 8th, 7th century, 8th, 8th, uh, AD, um, the, Zoroast, the followers of Zoroaster king, Persians, you know, they were following the Zoroaster religion. They came to uh, the west coast of India, so the northwest coast of India. And Hindu kings guided over them some places and temples and so on. So you can find this happening. Why they did that? Oh, they are coming from under that. All right, go ahead. They, so, because the, it was not dictated by a single individual founder and did not therefore follow a single individual church, single individual hierarchy. So that may be the explanation why there were so many philosophical schools. You can find even the teachers of materialism, Indian materialism, they were called Charva, they were called Charva Rishi. You used to call them Rishi. So how can a materialist be called a Rishi? <laughs> Rishi Mantra Trashta. So you can find this happening. This is, it was not founded by a single individual. And then it did not follow a single hierarchy. These are some of the reasons for this uh, mind-boggling diversity of 
different schools emerging side by side. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Swami. Yeah. I have another follow up to the is is when you talk about the shraddha uh, in in uh, Nachiketa. Is that this, like, I know Sri Ramakrishna said that faith is the most important thing. Yeah, yeah. I remember him saying, is that, is that a different use of the word faith, or is yeah, it... Exactly. In fact, even to Vivekananda used Shraddha in that sense alone. Swami Vivekananda, he, 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 uh, he used that term exactly in the sense in which Sri Ramakrishna used the word faith, Shraddha. Not faith in the normal dictionary meaning, but it goes far beyond. If you have, if if a if an arti, if a carpenter has sadha, he will make something really wonderful. He will be happy about it. The thing will be happy. What he what he builds will be happy, and also that also will give him an inner happiness. Because with sadha, whatever you do, that takes you to higher. That takes you along the road to higher life. It is not perfectionism as we understand in modern times. It's not perfectionism. Some, you can be very perfect. A uh, carpenter may make a wonderful uh, uh, chair, but he may be all miserable within me. But uh, Santa will make you do something that's really wonderful and also will give the person a kind of inner fulfillment and joy. That's an interesting thing. It would take you on in the road to your own spiritual evolution, right? Does, does that include, like, faith in God, faith that God will yeah. help you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true, that's true, that's true, yeah. That's certainly, in fact, uh, all, all great mystics in all traditions were men of this sattha, this faith, that total integrity, total identification with what they believe in, what they do. You can find, the, find this in men like uh, great leaders, political leaders like Lincoln or Gandhi, you find this, the integrity sattha. Uh, it, take, it, it, it helps you to convert what you believe in into a great idealism, a great ideal, something that you totally identify with. So thank you for uh, wonderful questions which help me to explain things which I may have overlooked in the normal course of the lecture. Maharaj, there's one more question. Yeah. AJ, please yeah. go ahead and ask. Yeah. Yeah. Last question. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for the lecture, Swami. Uh, so, a question real quick. So, at the outset uh, of this lecture, uh, what I thought I heard was when there are contradictions between the Shrutis, Smritis yeah. and Purana, the yeah. order is, is uh, Shruti greater than Smriti greater than Puranas yeah. and that is admitted by the authors themselves. Yeah. I wonder why there is room for contradiction and if they are aware of the contradiction, yeah. why they are not preventively yeah. 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 Not, uh, yeah. avoiding that. Yeah. That again, that again uh, will take us to this question, the gradual evolution, you know. A huge country, Indian subcontinent, you have to include India of those times included, today's Afghanistan, Burma, uh, and also culturally, even Ceylon, today's Sri Lanka. So huge landmass which are highly densely populated place. So uh, the highest Ved Vedantic teachings did not reach the masses. Even you, today you find India, uh, people belong to different levels of understanding and convictions. So, so naturally, uh, in different settlements, different societies, different practices prevailed, different interpretations prevailed, uh, based on their own tribal, tribalistic um, practices or understanding. So there was a lot of diversity. That's why uh, innumerable uh, smurdis uh, emerged. 
you have to remember smurdis are nothing but attempts to practice the highest teachings at different levels smurdis do contain some great teachings no doubt about it for example grihastha suyada pasye vali palidam atmanah apatyasya apatyam tad aranyam samase you find manusmurdi now manusmurdi for example says every now every household when he gets old when his face gets wrinkled when his hair gets uh, gray he should retire to a forest hermitage and spend the rest of his lifetime in contemplation nature person should do that ye etra narist pujinte tatra deva ramandi cha etra yadastu na pujinte tatra tatra sarva phala kriya so manusmurdi so wherever women are honored and respected the even gods are happy and pleased wherever women are not honored and respected all actions go in vain this also smriti and also there are statements in the smriti literature which actually restricts the freedom of the women folk so where do you draw the line there were different interpretation different practices in so many different levels of society so uh, one of the great smurti so this smurti kairas must have compiled them all together in one work there were all together so many parasara pastamba uh, ashwalayana then vyasa jabala uh, so many smurtis are there jagnyavakya smurti is very very prominent which actually played which very broad very scientific which actually uh, speaks against capital punishment Uh, there are statements in yajna kismati which actually forbids capital punishment so the point is there were diverse ideas some of them are very very scientific very modern very rational some of them appear to be a bit divisive and unjust so these must have developed in different communities different tribes vedic tribes you know this must be only explanation yeah thank you namaskar all of you om shanti 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 hi hari hi om tat sat sri ramakrishna arpanamastu